I'm going to preach from this point today. What is love? What is love? If you would, lay your Bible down. We're going to go one more time before the throne room. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for what we feel in this place today, God. I pray that, Lord, as we endeavor to learn what love truly is, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that, Lord God, that we would receive what thus saith the Lord. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. If you're going to help me preach, clap your hands to the Lord as you're seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. I do realize that while I'm preaching, it's getting worse outside, so I'm very mindful of that. I'm so very thankful for everybody who ventured out. I will tell you that as I pulled up in my little minivan and I was getting my heathen children out, I looked across, I looked to my right-hand side, and I seen this beautiful little couple getting out of a little yellow Easter egg-looking car, and there they were, and driving all the way from Carrollton, and I am so thankful for that, and God is going to bless you all. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what is this thing called love? No doubt at the mention of the title, love songs begin to run through your mind. I know that Brother Arms, probably the first thing after I said, what is love? He said, baby, don't hurt me no more. <laughs> no doubt in my mind. <laughs> but as we say that, I know that love songs flood our minds. I know that Brother Woods was thinking about air supply. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I, look, he's blushing. I got his number. <laughs> but love, love is something that we all cherish. And on Valentine's Day, I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to speak about what love really is. I think today it's been convoluted into something that doesn't even resemble what it should be. Today, uh, today's love in most cases is not love at all, but it's more lust than it is love. Hallelujah. I know the song that ran through my mind today was this one. I woke up and I cooked breakfast this morning. I made the awfulest mess you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> I did. I, I served my wife breakfast because I wanted to do something special for her for Valentine's Day. And she ate it, and it was edible, which was a plus. <laughs> Can I get a witness, man? <laughs> so it was edible, and she enjoyed it. And she sat back, and she did her morning devotion, and she was trying to wrangle the kids. And then she walked into the kitchen. She said, what have you done? <laughs> But it was all good because it was all in love. But the song that, uh, the, the song that uh, I thought about, and I'm going to sing to my beautiful wife right now, is L is for the way you look at me. Oh, because you're the only one I see. V, because you're very, very extraordinary. E. I love you even more than any other day before. I've got the rest of the lyrics, but I'm going to spare the audience today. <laughs> and no doubt that all of us share that today. I know as I look across and uh, my, 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 the Wilsons, they, I, I just love them. And they brought their uh, their wedding picture in, and it just it, it touched my heart. How long have you guys been married now? Wow, wow. I hope we can ascertain that without my wife killing me. Moving on. How many of us really know what love is? See, I think in today's society that we base it on the appearance that you know I, I, I listen well I don't really listen voluntarily we'll say that but as I go into Walmart as I go into different Applebee's and this and you hear songs come on and you try to understand what they're singing I listen to lyrics and I cringe deep down in my heart it's all based on the outward and my wife will attest to you that the outward appearance don't last very long it doesn't. Sister Erica, I'm sorry. Ethan's a hunky looking guy right now. I know. But a couple years, he's going to look like this. <laughs> you may want to weigh your options out now. <laughs> Was it really that funny? <laughs> 
I got an amen corner over here. I'm doing good already. <laughs> so, love and charity in the Bible, how many times is it mentioned? 466 times love is mentioned. Charity in the Bible is synonymous with love. Now, is it the most mentioned word in the Bible? Ah. Uh, Thou is mentioned 4,600 times, so no, love doesn't have a chance of being the top at all. So what did the all-knowing, never an error Wikipedia say about love? It says there's four types of love. There's agape, which is brotherly love, charity, or the love God has for man and of man for God. There's eros, which is the love that we sing about in love songs where we want to kiss all over our one that we care about and we want to make googly eyes at him and all that mushy stuff eros and then there's philia and that's affectionate regard or friendship that's the kind of love that when i grab brother arms around the neck and i say i love you bro i'm not trying to lay a kiss on him but i love him as my brother yeah. let's clarify that i know the bible said to greet one another with a holy kiss but we ain't about that mess around here <laughs> that was a whole different time and a whole different culture my 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 and then i really liked this one this one was really funny because it hit home hopefully not with my wife but with me and my son it's storhe it says love and affection especially of parents to children it's common or natural empathy like that felt by parents or offspring now this is where it gets funny rarely used in ancient works and then almost exclusively as a descriptor of relationships within the family it is also known to express the mere acceptance or putting up with situations yeah I love him <laughs> so that's kind of my mind of my son's relationship yeah I love my dad but don't let him get around me <laughs> so I want, in order to, I want to see what the Bible says about it. So in order to see what the Bible has to say about love, let's look at uh, the Apostle Paul's exhortations to the Corinthians. The Corinth uh, area was one of the largest and greatest cities of Greece. Its population was about 75,000, and it had been one of the most important cities of Greece since the 8th century B.C. It was destroyed by the Romans in 146 B.C. and rebuilt by Julius Caesar. Its two harbors allowed excellent access to both Asia and Italy, making it an important stop on the valued Mediterranean trade route. It did a flourishing business trade and was bustling tourist center with many people drawn to its shrines. Corinth was long before Christianity a city of love in the worldly sense. There existed there the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. A temple dedicated to her stood on a high hill near the city. It was said to have been populated by thousands of temple priestesses. In essence, were these women of God? Absolutely not. Upon further review, Brother Dale, they were basically prostitutes there. And all of the sailors would stop there. And they taught sexual love with them was the way of truth. It's an interesting and popular misconception in its day. It also housed the Temple of Dionysus. Yeah, I didn't sneeze. That was actually the name. The Greek god of wine and intoxication and the Temple of Isis, an Egyptian goddess, the enchantress and god of magic. Corinth was an ungodly party town at its best. Our world has been sucked in to that same scenario. We've been sucked into that same lie. We, we've been sucked into where we think that love is something that can be discarded at any time. We, we, we believe that nothing's worth fighting for. We believe that it's all sensual. But Paul had chosen this den of iniquity for his place of exhortations on love because many of the people of Corinth had the wrong idea of love, just like some do today. Paul knew Corinth well as he had preached there. So let's look at Paul's dissection of love. In verse 4 he says, it, Love suffers long and is, in, is kind. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And the last one, I'm going to put a little emphasis on, and you're going to hear it again. Love never fails. 
love never fails. If you have an insurrection in your family, guess what? Love never fails. Yeah, you, uh, look, I'm going to tell you that how many of us, how many of us have families that fight? Anybody? Come on, we can be honest. I'll tell you, my family, me and my mom, Lord have mercy, we try to get along. But there's just times that we don't. But love never fails. Love will fix it. And every time we go and we say, I'm sorry. That's just me being painfully obvious, uh, painfully transparent. We can't think that we're all alone on our island just because that we have problems. But love never fails to fix problems. Let's take a closer look. Love suffers long. It will endure. It's not quick to anger. It puts up with the inadequacies of others. It can endure evil and provocation. It endures with many slights and neglects from the person it loves. Thank God. Because us men are oblivious. How many of us got our wife something for Valentine's Day? I don't even like you guys no more. I'll see you after. Hey, we're going to meet up in the office. Uh, how many of us didn't get our wife something for Valentine's Day? I'll be, I'll be on this side. <laughs> oh, very good. After this sermon, I guarantee you, all of us are going to the, we're going to Walmart or somewhere. <laughs> well, maybe not Walmart. My wife like. <laughs> oh, so sweet. It endures the slights and neglects from the person it loves, and it has patience to await the eventual good that it believes shall eventually prevail in others through faith in God's ability to change them. There's so many stories, including mine, where my wife saw something in me that nobody else seen. Brother Arms, I was going nowhere fast. But God allowed my wife to come and uh, to stumble into my life, but uh, she really didn't stumble in there. She was put there. I told the story at camp years ago that uh, we saved each other simply because my wife was getting ready to have a baby with someone who didn't want a baby and I was on the highway to hell so to speak I knew nothing of truth and she just looking for somebody who would be a good godly father looking at me when we met I didn't look like I was going to be very godly honey I don't know what in the world you saw I'm glad that you didn't go to the eye doctor I got gotcha. you but a person who really loves can see beyond failures. Well, uh, look, I'm glad my wife didn't give up on me. How many of us men we've ever tripped and fell, uh, fallen? And we, we haven't always been exactly what our wives deserve. I'm going to tell you right now, there's been times where I felt so horrible, but her love was enough. Let me tell you something, that's the same way our Father's love is for us. Don't you ever get tripped up thinking that you don't count. God loves us through our failures. God loves us through our faults and through our trips and through the times that we mess up. God still loves us. If we can love our spouses through stuff like that, how much more must God love us? It's important that we know what love is. It has self-restraint. In our current day of domestic violence and sexual unfaithfulness and broken relationships, it is an important aspect of true love and one against which many of us will surely be tested. For in it we see that love can and must be able to suffer the pain of betrayal without ceasing to truly care for and continue to love those who have betrayed us, wronged us, or simply who do not accept or understand what true love is. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44 through 48, Jesus is speaking. And he says this, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. What, Jesus? Apparently you don't know what they did to me. Apparently you don't know how they talked about me. But he said, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on evil and on the good and sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust now watch this for if you love them which love you what reward have you do not even the publicans do the same they do the same thing people out in the world can love their friends but who can love their enemies 
Who can get down and pray for the one that hurts you? The one that hurts somebody that you love? Let me hit home. Because that's where God got me a few years ago. He asked me. Uh, something tragic happened. And I was so angry. And God said, so what are you going to do now, preacher? Are you going to get vengeance or are you going to pray for him? Man, I'm going to tell you, it hurt my feel good, Brother Parrish. Because I wanted vengeance and I wanted it now. But God said, pray for them. God said, love them. God said, do the right thing. Read my word. If you have my heart, you're going to love like I love. Through failure. My, my, my. I know that I know y'all were expecting a heart box of candies, but I ain't got it today. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Love is kind. It's useful, benign. It's not rough or harsh. It seeks to do good. It's patient, though injured by others. How many of us have been hurt? Hurt by people that we trusted, people we loved, people we gave our whole heart to. My Lord, I'm going to tell you, I have been hurt by people I thought would never, ever, ever hurt me. But through it, I've learned to love. I'm going to tell you, Chris, it hurts when they hurt you. And it feels like, it, I can only imagine and I can only compare it to what Jesus must have felt when they were whipping him at the post. That's how I feel when that happens. Because that person that you love so much turns their back on you and betrays you. But you should still love them. That's what the Bible says. The purpose, is, the purpose of love is to seek the welfare of the one loved. We also learn that kindness is more apt to encourage good in another person. This kindness brings out the best in they who are loved. It's hard to love through hurt. But I'm telling you, if you want God to send you a blessing like you've never received before, try it. When somebody hurts you, just love them and pray for them. Being angry doesn't help nobody. But Christ said his love will make you perfect in the Father's eyes. Let's look at what Paul said love is not. Love does not envy. It rejoices in the successes of others. It is content with what the Lord has kindly allowed it. Envy is least productive of all sins and it wishes less for someone else while doing nothing productive for they who envy. In real love, we're not envious of those who appear to be getting a better break than us. Just because it Brother Parrish is so much better at carpentry at me than me doesn't mean I ain't gonna like him. I might tell him I might not like him, but I don't mean it in my heart. I'm just a little jealous. But I know at the end of the day that God has blessed him with that. Just because that Brother Arms has a Mustang Cobra and I don't, I'm not gonna be angry. I might want to ride in it every now and then, but I'm not gonna get angry. Love does not envy. I'm not going to be... Sister Gina, tomorrow, if you would... Is she in here? Man. Sister Melissa, tomorrow, if you get blessed with $2 million, and I pray that you do, I'm not going to be angry with you. I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to rejoice with you. Why? Because I don't know what Sister Melissa's been through. And if God decides to bless her, that's between her and God. And I'm going to be happy with her. The Bible says to rejoice with those that rejoice. Mourn with those that mourn. Come on, she's my sister. I love her. And I'm going to, be, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to jump up and down and shout with her. And if she wants to shower, with me, shower me with money, that's fine. And if not, that's fine too. <laughs> love does not envy love does not parade itself Woo. how many of us hate public displays of affection anybody I used to try to dance with my wife in public all the time oh man she hated it I might dance with her today I don't know <laughs> I can remember when I was a teenager and 
I just I couldn't stand that when people would be all making out right out in public it's like for real I just but it subdues pride it will esteem others and limits its own esteem it will wait patiently until others praise it it's anonymous it doesn't brag about its own accomplishments it's guardful and carefully worded in subtle statements of self-promotion it does not put itself in the spotlight it handles its own prosperity and successes in a humble manner it does not boast let me tell you something brother Wilfredo if I go help somebody and then I come to church and I tell everybody about look what I've done well I got my reward right there there ain't going to be no reward in heaven for that there, there's no reward in heaven for that but it's what you do in secret it's what you do in secret and see nobody else knows but you but you know true love it doesn't care about recognition it cares about making sure that it loves somebody else love is not puffed up it's not bloated with self-conceit it abhors flattery how many of us know how to take a compliment yeah I don't I, I really don't I hate it when people compliment me brother arms here tell me man that was a good service I was thinking man was he in the same service I was in that was awful I don't know how to do it because I don't ever want to be that guy that pop my suspenders yeah it was a good one wasn't it that's not true love but true love wants to be humble it doesn't boast it puffed up people have an exaggerated opinion of their own importance Whew. and often feel that their happiness and well-being are the most important thing in life as such it's easy for them to dismiss the needs and feelings of others we don't need to be that person folks and I know this is slowed down from last week but I just this is an important topic because if we don't get this right we will never grow this church. We will never reach the lost if we don't know the true meaning of love. We need to make sure that we put other feelings ahead of ours. We need to make sure that we don't put our happiness above someone's feelings. That we don't seek out things at the cost of anyone's feelings. Love does not behave rudely. It behaves with reverence and respect toward all mankind. And toward love itself it does not unduly censor or despise others conduct it will do nothing that is unbecoming to it it holds true love as a precious thing deserving of respect and does not publicly parade it it does not ever ask anyone to do something that is contrary to good principles of conscious faith in God's morals let me tell you young people something sister Emily there's going to be some young boy that's going to want to put you on his arm. He's going to want you as a girlfriend. I, I, that's what I'm saying. You keep that up. And I, I, somebody take notes on it. Are you recording right now? Because she just said no. I'm going to tell you, if he asks you to do anything that goes against God's morals, you better run. Because one, oh, <laughs> one compromise will lead to another and you'll end up hurt and lost. But I'm telling you, true love, it cares about your feelings. True love would never ask you to do anything that you don't want to. Anything that goes against your conscience. True love is patient and kind and loving. In essence, don't misuse the name of love for an ungodly purpose. For it is the clear indication of love that it is not. For real love seeks always the best for they that are loved. And does not look for personal gain pleasure or control love does not seek its own it's an enemy of selfishness it does not seek its own praise or profit it neglects its own for the sake of others it prefers the welfare of others before itself it's self-sacrificing it looks out for the interest of others Paul notes in Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 can you pull that up let nothing be done through strife or vainglory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves well, what does that mean that means that before I go I'm gonna make sure that brother Woods has what he needs before I look after myself I'm gonna make sure that brother Dale's okay 
I'm going to think about the feelings of others. I'm going to make sure that my brother or my sister, and you know what? It doesn't even have to be a brother and a sister in the church. I'm going to tell you, God sees when you feed a homeless person. I believe that 100%. I know that some of them are professional panhandlers. I get it. But what if they're not? Prefer others over yourselves. Look, one person said it like this. I, you cannot take it with you. I've seen people bury themselves in pleasures of this world and things and at the end of the day be so unhappy. But when you're given out to others, I'm going to tell you, your soul will be satisfied. When you give out the way God would give out and you allow God to use you to bless others, your soul will be satisfied and you will have more than anyone could ever imagine when you put others above yourself. Clap your hands to the Lord. <laughs> Love is not pro provoked. It's not sharp tempered, but it sweetens and softens. It's not quick to display its passions. It confines them with proper limits. It's never angry without a truly just cause. Even then, tempers it to a good, godly purpose alone. If you are quick to anger, you better check your love. I'm going to tell you, I've seen people that will get angry at the drop of a hat. There's something wrong and we need to check it out. You need to make sure that we respond and not react. We need to make sure that even when... Our husbands, uh, Sister Veronica, I know Brother Barry's a bonehead. I get it. I am too. We're birds of a feather. We flock together. But you got to love us through it. You got to love him through it. Sister Lawson, she, she's endured it for a long time. <laughs> but when you love, you're not sharp. You realize that, well, that's just the way they are. And I'm going to love them until God changes them. That goes within the church. That doesn't only go with your spouse. But when people do bonehead things, how many of us have ever done bonehead things? Bonehead things. My Lord. <laughs> we were telling stories on each other the other night, and I remembered one time my uh, brother-in-law, we had some visitors to the church, and there was one guy who was a dwarf. He was a true midget. My brother-in-law, he just all smiles, had a million-dollar smile on him, dressed to the nines. Boy, he looked good. He walks up, slaps him on the arm, says, hey, big guy. <laughs> the guy's a midget. He says, hey, big guy. I was like, oh, dear Lord, what have you just done? <laughs> or the time that, uh, I'll just tell all the ones on him right now since he's not here to defend himself. Or the time that a gentleman brought a guest with him and she looked a little bit older than him. And Brother Gillum stood at the pulpit. And he said, so-and-so, I'm so glad to see your mother's with this when actually it was his fiance. <laughs> oh, even when we do bonehead things, love is kind. I know his wife wanted to slap him. I couldn't help but laugh at him. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because I do the same bonehead things. But it's never angry without a truly just cause. We're going to do dumb things. But Kevin, I will just go ahead and tell you, I'm going to do some dumb things. There's, there's going to be times that I do dumb things, and I hope that you love me through them because they're never meant maliciously. Love thinks no evil. It has no malice thinks not of revenge and has no long anger. It does not ascribe guilt to others, Ethan. Doesn't make them feel bad by inference or innuendo. It's not jealous or suspicious. It will never indulge suspicions, but arms you better quit it without proofs. What am I saying here? You remember at the Last Supper, Brother Dale, Jesus said, one of y'all going to betray me. Now, when I look, at, I look back at the Bible's recollection of that, I don't see Peter lean over to Paul and say, Kevin was looking pretty shady tonight. I bet he's the guy. I didn't see Matthew lean, lean over to Luke and say, I bet that was that sister Lawson lady. Look at her. She's shifty. 
But do you, do you recall what the Bible said about that? Each disciple looked at Jesus and said, Is it I? That's true love. Regardless of what somebody's going through, they may have a bad day. They may be a little off. We don't give into suspicion. We don't think, oh, they must be in sin. But instead, we think, I better pray for them. I better love them because they may be going through something. I better, uh, I better, ha. Uh, I'm so tired of churches that want to size somebody up when they're going through a little bit of something. True love doesn't do that. True love reaches out to that person. True love wants to be there for that person. True love wants to make sure that that person's all right. True love is not going to leave that person abandoned. True love is going to do what it takes to make sure that person is okay. True love. It doesn't think evil. It will only reluctantly give in to a poor opinion of another and only with regret and reluctance when evidence cannot be reputed. It will never suspect ill or reason itself into bad opinions upon mere appearances. It will always think the best it can even when circumstances might appear damning. It does not store up memory of wrongdoing. I don't care what they did yesterday. Let it go. The same way Jesus has forgiven us, let it go. You forgive them. I, am I saying that you have to remain vulnerable to that person? No. But what I'm saying is you let it go and you move on. You don't harbor feelings toward that person. You love them from a distance. You pray for them, but you don't hold a grudge. You don't keep that memory. It will destroy you. Love does not rejoice and iniquity it takes no pleasure in hurting others it thinks no evil without clear proof real love cannot treat evil as an innocent option but hates evil and not the doer I'm gonna stop right there God loves a murderer there are people on death row right now that God is reaching for at the prison in LaGrange bro I have uh, friends of mine that go there and minister and God has touched so many people in there and there have been many baptized yes they made bad decisions yes they didn't always walk a straight line but yes my father in heaven still died for them Jesus still went to the cross for them he still loves them in spite of their situation we better make sure that we've got love right if we're wanting to be accepted of God we better understand that see, even because somebody has a past, it doesn't mean that has to be their future. It does not have to be their future. It doesn't rejoice in the failings of others. In fact, the sins of others will stir its compassions. Love does not gossip or publish the news of someone else's shame. It does not find a light in anything God says is wrong. If you find yourself gossiping about somebody falling, you better check yourself. If you find yourself talking and sharing shameful news about anyone, we better check ourselves because something's wrong with our love. But then Paul comes back and he says, but let me tell you what love does. Love rejoices in the truth. It is happy in the success of the gospel, and it rejoices to see a man molded by it. I don't care if the drunk comes in off the street. When he receives the Holy Ghost, we better be rejoicing with him because God is doing a new thing. I'm going to tell you, when, <laughs> when we see the people that we had no idea God was working on come in here, we better be rejoicing because the Bible says that love rejoices in the truth. There are going to be people touched that we didn't think were going to be touched. There are going to be people that pray through that we had no idea it was coming. There are going to be people that are going to be called to ministry and we're going to be like, how in the world did they get called to ministry? Doesn't God know what they did? Yeah, that's why, that's why he called them to ministry because of their past. Why do you think he called Paul? Paul was formerly Saul, Brother Parrish, and he used to kill Christians. They were afraid of him. But when he preached, they loved him. They loved him. We need to make sure that we're not the elder brother when backsliders come back. There are going to be people come in. There, I'm going to tell you, I feel in my spirit that there's going to be an overflow of backsliders. 
I believe there's going to be people that are, have been hurt by church that are going to come to uh, come to in this day and hour where it seems like the book of revelations is unfolding right before our face and by the way it is people are going to come back to the church and we better be ready to accept them and love them just as they are as if nothing happened just like the father did with the prodigal that's what true love is hallelujah mm -mm -mm. It takes no joy in the sins of others, but it's highly delighted to see them do well. It wants to see truth and justice prevail. It does not believe in truth takes pleasure in unrighteousness. We know that the Bible is truth and we need to rejoice in it and lead others to do likewise while we rejoice in the presence and the fellowship of the like-minded, celebrating the truth and joyfully worship, worshiping with our Christian brothers and sisters is an honor to be called to do such when we come in here we need to shout like it like we're getting ready to enter the rapture well i'm gonna tell you i was so ecstatic earlier when we broke out in worship because i'm gonna tell you it's that kind of atmosphere that where things are changed it's that kind of atmosphere where uh, and maybe some uh, some will argue with me but i know that's what we're going to be doing in heaven is worshiping love bears all things love covers it covers as a shield or a roof to protect it is not for the publishing of the faults of a brother it will put up with injuries without indulging anger and cherishing revenge it will be patient with provocation it will hold firm though it be shocked and borne hard upon it will sustain all manner of injury and ill treatment bearing up under it it will put up with all manner of hazards and difficulties. Love even gives the unrepentant sinner an advocate and an intercessor who prays for their well-being. How many of us have prayed and we felt like we were praying for somebody and we didn't know who? There's people that we've prayed for in prayer that we have no idea what's been done in their life. That's love being active in your life when we do that that's love being manifest love provides a shelter that withstands the worst circumstances let all reside under our sheltering love when it all comes down when it seems like your world is imploding love is going to shelter people how many of us as parents let me talk to the parents real quick We've seen our world implode and we sheltered our kids so they didn't feel the aftershocks of it. That's love. When you do everything you can to make sure that nobody knows what's really going on and you shelter them. I'm going to tell you there's been many times that we've had to shelter our kids. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't take none of it back because that's what love is about. There's going to be times that we're going to have to shelter some in the church. But that's what we're here for. We're called to be that. If, you're a, if you call yourself a Christian, we are to love beyond measure, even when it hurts. Even, even when people in the church have wronged us. Even when we don't understand the situation, we have to love. Love believes in all things. While not naive, it hopes within reason, well for all. It will stretch its faith beyond appearances to have a kind opinion. Fueled by our faith in God, it is central for developing a Christ-like love, rooted and grounded in the right kind of faith. For some of that, and for some of us, that comes really easy. For me, it comes really easy because I know where I came from and I know what God's capable of. So when I see someone, I don't see maybe what the average Joe sees, but I see what God can do in them. I see a, a, a testimony being developed that God can use. I see the people that they can reach. I see their potential. And that's the way we need to look at each other. You know, some people back in my day, I, to be very clear, and transparent there were some that didn't see me making it past my 24th birthday because of the lifestyle I was living I actually had one fella come into my house and he told my mom what a dirtbag I was right to her face just told her how bad I was but God seen something different church we need to see something different in everyone I don't care who it is
I don't care what their situation is, what their background is. When we learn to believe all things, we're going to believe that that person will be the greatest soul winner that Shelbyville's ever seen. We'll believe that that person is going to turn around and be the biggest advocate for the church that anyone has ever seen. Come on, if he can do it for Paul, he can do it for anybody in Shelbyville. If he can do it for Peter, he can do it for anybody out here. If he can do it <laughs> for the woman for, with an issue of blood, he can do it here. But we, he has to feel love from us. Look, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing more uncomfortable, Sister Melissa, than coming into a church and feeling like you're sized up. There's nothing more uncomfortable, Brother Wilson, than coming in and people giving you this look. And I've got this one before. Trying to size you. I just, I'm just thankful it ain't raining so they don't drown. I'm for real. I mean, I've seen some people. You know the one, or, or they'll look, they'll have their little glasses on. Oh, do I have those glasses? You took the glasses. I was going to put them on. I found a pair of glasses. But anyway, they'll look over top of their glasses at you and try to size you up. Come on, I can't stand that mess. I pray that, I pray that no one ever does that here because if I find out about it, there will be a meeting in the pastor's office. And I don't ever want to have that because we have to believe in everyone. Love hopes all things. Where it cannot believe well, it will at least hope well of others. It will champion the rightful cause of the underdog. It does not give up when others might. It knows failures are not final. Mm. Somebody said that failures are not final. Just because somebody messed up, it doesn't mean that that's the end. Just because Sister Lawson got pregnant at 16, it wasn't the end. Just because I was laying in a pool of my own blood because I was at the wrong place at the wrong time didn't mean it was the end. Just because that neighbors thought that I would never be anything more than a drunk, that wasn't the final report. That was, there was a preacher that loved me enough to say, hey, let me show you a better way. There was a preacher that came and taught me home Bible study at my house and said, Adam, you don't have to live this way no more. Adam, let me show you what God has for you. Adam, you don't have to turn back to a bottle again because Jesus has something better for you. He loved me enough through my circumstance. He didn't have to take time out to pray with us, but he did because he loved us and because his, the love of God was shining through it. Him. I would love to have that report about me. I called Brother Lawson and he prayed and everything changed and now I've been in church for this amount of years. I called Brother Arms and Brother Arms gave me a word and I was at my wit's end but when he prayed <laughs> Brother Arms changed it. He allowed God to use him and I've never been the same since. The day that Sister Betsy grabbed me and prayed with me <laughs> and she told me everything was going to be all right now I'm not talking about myself but I'm talking about the people that you're going to minister to I'm talking about Sister Betsy, the little girl that you're going to put your arm around and you're going to give, or give her words of wisdom. The young, the young married girl that seems like the world's coming to an end and you're going to grab her and you're going to say, honey, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and when she comes back with a testimony that says, I'll never forget that service when Sister Betsy put her arm around me and said, baby, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it and it turned my whole world see that's what's worth living for that's true love when you'll put yourself out there like that and you impact somebody's life that's true love I'm going to tell you I'll never forget when my pastor did that for me and I pray that we will allow ourselves to be used like that because that is what love is that is where love is it's not the sensual mess that they've got going on in the world but it's when you'll do these things that Paul wrote about Love endures all things, it, though it may be mistreated, unappreciated, unreturned, unevenly matched, 
true love remains steadfast through the insult and abandonment through trials through tribulation true love remains steadfast it does not give up it does not walk away it may be shaken but it will not be broken it is a solid rock it's which is what Christianity was built upon and it will endure and if you don't want to get a hold of it somebody else will but I'm going to tell you true love remains true love is not cowardly true love will stay when everybody else runs true love if I were to pull mamas across this sanctuary tonight or today if you were to see your baby about to be bit by a rattlesnake would you stand aside and let it be bit or would you run down and do your dead level best to get it away I already know the answer to that I already know I know my wife would fight the rattlesnake she'd bite his head off if she had to I already know she would and she'd win she would win it scares me to death but I'm going to tell you that's true love and that's the same type of love that we have to have that's the same type of love that we need to be striving for that regardless that we're going to stand firm that love that we understand that love never fails somebody said love never fails come on say it like you mean it love never fails Whew. it's a permanent and perpetual grace it always overcomes it always wins in the end while otherworldly gifts and possessions will someday lose their luster only love will always persevere I will never forget up until my wife and I got married at least once a week maybe even more than that I would bring her flowers or I'd bring her something I didn't care what it was. I, I worked as a pizza delivery boy and I got tips every day. So I would take part of that tips and she would get something special. And so after we got married, Brother Wilfredo, I, I continued that. And one day she said, honey, I love you, but I can't stand flowers. <laughs> she said, look, you want to do something nice for me? Buy me an outfit. These flowers are going to be dead in three or four days, but this outfit's going to last me a couple months. I do that. But even beyond that, flowers are going to fade away. Chocolate is going to melt away. All these things are going to melt away. But when you give someone true love, that doesn't, you can't put a price on that. You can't put an expiration date on that. You can't put a limit on that. Hallelujah. We will take nothing else with us. It is the only of our worldly possessions that we will be allowed to retain while other things must someday fall away. And love alone remains as a, with us as a parameter with which we shall be judged against. And as our gift and celebration with our Heavenly Father. These then are the things that we measure our love by. These are the benchmarks of true love. And let me tell you, we don't measure others' loves by these. This is not meant as a measuring tool to see if Sister Emily's living right. It's not for me to get out the tape measure and make sure that Brother Chris has got enough love in his life. But it's to measure ourselves. Just like the disciples. Is it I, Lord? Let me measure myself, God. Let me make sure I'm what I'm supposed to be. If we'll worry about ourselves as much as we do someone else, we will be in good, good shape. Now let me ask this. Can you say that you have true love remembering that our charge is to love all our neighbors or is there room for improvement Paul set before us a true challenge can you not see that love as true as Paul has outlined cannot help but be loved back cannot help to be but a true blessing that no one can take away from you can you not also see that Paul took Jesus' love as this model Replace above Jesus in each of Paul's ex exhortations where they use the word love. He fulfills them all, does he not? Now try it with your name. Does Adam really hope all things? Does Adam really endure all things? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Does Ethan bear all things? I hope so. 
to Sister Lawson rejoice in the truth. We need to make sure that we measure up. There are so many beautiful love stories in the Bible. I think of Adam and Eve when Eve had failed and she was destined to die. Adam would share her fate because he didn't see living another day without her. If we look at the story of Jacob and Rachel, he would serve yet seven years for Rachel. And when he was tricked, he would serve seven more because he loved her so much. He did it without hesitation. Boaz and Ruth, Ruth had nothing and nothing to offer. But Boaz saved her from certain death, certain starvation. But the greatest was this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 15 and 13 says this, Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. Music, if you would come. Luke 23 and 34, as you stand. Jesus being on the cross. He had just been beat with a cat of nine tails. Blood gushing out of his back. He, on that same back that was ripped open, carried a cross to Calvary. He's the same one that they nailed to the cross. They put his feet on there and they began to drive the spikes into him. Drove the nails in his hands and as if that wasn't bad enough, they hoisted that cross high in the air and allowed it to drop in that hole, ripping the hands and feet where the nails were. They had shamed him. They had mocked him. They had beat him in his face and pulled his beard. They had stripped him naked to humiliate him. And while they were... <laughs> while they were deciding who was going to get his clothes, Luke 23 and 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the greatest love story. Beyond the notebook, beyond Titanic, beyond all of these earthly love stories, that is a love story that even in the face of humiliation, even in the face of being beat beyond recognition, he said, Father, don't lay it against them. They don't know what they're doing. That's true love. I'm going to open up this altar. If you want to recommit to him today, if you, if you want to check your love level, it's going to be at this altar today. If you want to get your love checked, if you want to recommit to Christ, if you want to move forward in him, this altar is open. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. Uh,